today is Wednesday. The weather outside is indeed frightful. I've got my TV on mute, the blinds are closed, I'm locked away in my living room. And that can only mean one thing, that today is the perfect time for story time. Now if you are indeed new here, my name is Cameron. Every week or so, I retell a story throughout the past. True crime, murder, American gangsters, pirates or I have been influenced by the world of drinks because throughout time, throughout history, a lot of comedy, a lot of horror and a lot of true crime has all been influenced by the devil's nectar, that is drinks. Do you have to know about drinks to enjoy this podcast? No you do not. Do you have to drink at all to enjoy this podcast? No you don't, it's just some good stories that happen to be influenced by drinks that I've picked up over the time and I'm going to share the best ones right here with you on this podcast which is Nightcap, Nightcap, the podcast in which we retell stories of myth and murder, lies and legends, all in the world of drinks with me your host Cameron. In the past we have spoke about the rise and fall of absinthe, hallucinations and murderous rampages, we've also spoke about wine counterfeiting and today I'm going to take you to American Prohibition where we're going to talk about the king of bootlegging himself, the man who influenced the great Gatsby, the man who influenced American law, whose daughter went on to play Dorothy in the first on-screen portrayal of The Wizard of Oz. That is, of course, none other than George Remus. But before we get into that, there's two things. Firstly, how are you? How are you doing? You all right? You feeling good? Personally, I'm feeling I'm feeling quite good. You know, I'm putting on my Christmas decorations. There's a festive feeling in the air. I'm feeling fantastic. And secondly, this is of course Nightcap, so grab yourself a drink, whatever that might be. These stories are always better with a drink in hand. Maybe you're on the vino. Maybe you're on a little brewska. Maybe you're on something a little bit harder. Oh, little, little glass of whisker. Little whiskey. Little whiskey on the rocks. Scotch on the rocks. Or maybe you're not drinking today, maybe you're on some of that high quality, purified, twice distilled, H2O smart water. Maybe you're just having a cup of tea. Controversially, I'm not drinking today, I am on the coffee. That is right, I've got that pure, 100% Arabic, single origin, expressed coffee. (sighs) Delicious stuff, makes me feel alive. Now we've wet our whistles. It's time for the story of George Remus. To understand the full story of George Remus, we must start when he was a boy. Because when he was young, a lot of the building blocks are put into place to which he would grow his empire. So George Remus was born 1878 of German descent. He moved to America with his family when he was but a boy, where he would settle in Chicago. By 1893, George Remus got a job within his uncle's pharmacy over there in Chicago and he spends the next 10 years growing quite a humble life. He's a very educated man or he tries to be. He's studying a lot, he's learning about American life, about American law in particular. He's also really interested within the pharmaceutical trade so he's studying for that. By 1899 he gains his pharmacy license and he purchases his uncle's pharmacist, he also gains his law degree. Now just to give you an idea of the kind of man George was, this course for his law degree would take three years. George would complete that in just 18 months whilst also studying for his pharmacy license and whilst also marrying a woman and having a kid. So 1893, George, 24, 25 years old, whatever, doesn't matter he's a young man now he's a young adult he owns a pharmacy he's got a law degree he has a wife Lillian and he also has a kid Ramola who would go on to find fame in her own right portraying Dorothy on the first on-screen portrayal of The Wizard of Oz but this story isn't about Ramola this story is about George Remus so back to the man at hand we're now in the early 1900s Prohibition is in the air. Now, if you don't know about Prohibition, just to quickly explain, that is the period of time between 1920 and 1933 when the sale of alcohol would become illegal in America, dubbed the Great Experiment. You know, some 
God-fearing individuals thought that alcohol was the work of the devil and without it, America would do nothing if not flourish. You know, a purified America with no drunks, no money wasted on booze, just good God-fearing individuals working hard. Obviously, this did not go down well. A lot of people loved to drink. A lot of people felt the need to drink. Illegal clubs were opened, named speakeasies. The rise of gangsters became apparent because suddenly all these criminal masterminds had a way to make money that wasn't selling guns, that wasn't working with other criminals, that wasn't selling drugs. Just, just by distributing and working around the system of prohibition, you can make quite a heavy sum of money you know this is the time when gangsters like Al Capone really raised up and really made their millions so it was good good time for gangsters bad time for the government now during the early 1900s we're talking we're about 1909 now a lot of American states start taking prohibition into their own hands and start practicing Chicago being one of those places where two-thirds of Chicago precincts was actually practicing prohibition and this seen the rise of early bootleggers. Now bootleggers were people who either illegally smuggled booze or illegally made booze. In America we're talking whiskey, so we're talking bourbon. They would illegally get this and distribute it throughout prohibition. So they were taking it from American states that wasn't practicing prohibition smuggling it in and then distributing it and making a fair sum of money in the run. There were prohibition agents around Chicago whose job was to stop these people. They would, they would arrest them and George Remus was the man who would defend them on those bootlegging charges. And it was at this time when George Remus really started to formulate some kind of, some kind of plan. He figured out two things, all right? One thing was that the reason a lot of these people were getting caught was because they had criminal or gangster mindsets. Violence, evade the law, smuggle it in. You know, if you, you break the law at some point, you're gonna get caught. And he knew that. And then the second thing he figured out was that his clients, they were making a lot of money. Surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, there is a hell of a lot of money to be made by distributing alcohol illegally. You don't have to worry about regulations, you don't have to worry about tax, you don't even have to worry about pricing because hey they can't get it anywhere else, they can only get it from you. So you can sell it at whatever price you want, they was making an absolute killing. That being said, George Remus is still your everyday man, he's got no notoriety so far but then he begins to gain it in one specific case he's working on which is the William Cheney case. Now, William was arrested on charges of murdering his wife in cold blood. He went to court, George Remus would be the man to defend William. Understanding that there was absolutely no way he was gonna get him off, he was starting to think about cases he'd heard in the past. Cases where men who were insane or mentally ill would do these horrific crimes, and instead of getting sent to prison, they would instead get sent to mental institutes because, hey, they was insane, right? So he starts thinking about this and hmm, I wonder if there's a way I can use this and he comes up with a plan where he says, well, William shouldn't go to prison because he was suffering from temporary insanity. Now you've probably heard about this before in films or in other true crime documentaries, this whole mindset that for a, a slip of a moment you can temporarily lose your mind, go insane, black out completely, do these horrific crimes and the next day you just can't remember it and doing this man you can't legally go to prison because technically to your knowledge you didn't commit no crime as you was temporarily mentally ill you know this is a big part of american law and george remus at this point in time was the man who pioneered this technique he actually called it the transitory insanity defense and by doing this william got quite a light sentence and george made all the newspapers and gained notoriety as a defense lawyer. After that, we get to 1918. The Volstead Act is dropped. Now the Volstead Act is basically prohibition. This would outline everything that prohibition was about, everything that was about to become illegal. 
With his successful past of defending bootleggers, George began reading this at really interesting every single day you know this is like a big a book worth of information this false act and he's reading it back to front every day trying to look for loopholes he knows there's a lot of money to be made in bootlegging but he also knows it's very difficult to pull off but george he sees america as the land of opportunity and he wants to build this empire not from violence or criminalities or systematic violence Rather, he wants to build his empire from intellect. And if there's any loopholes within this act, believe me, you, George, was going to be the man to find it. And that he did. There was two pieces of information here that interest George. One being that you could still make and sell alcohol as long as it was government bonded whisker. See, during this time, a lot of whisky, a lot of alcohol, still today, gets used for other things, not just drinking, not just getting drunk but a various amount of uses, one being medicinal. So government bonded warehouses, where they could control that, was still allowed to sell alcohol. Which leads me to his second loophole he found, is that you could still purchase alcohol if you intended to use it for medicinal purposes. So pharmacists and drug companies. You see how it's all coming together now? You see how the story is building? He built his life working in a pharmacy he has a pharmaceutical license he's now studying law and he finds his loopholes he finds more than a loophole he finds more than just a simple way around the system what he finds is opportunity and it is at that point when george begins to formulate a plan of action of how he can take this opportunity that leads us on to 1920 prohibition is in full swing. And now this is a good opportunity within our story to take a little break. George is still a nobody. Prohibition's in full swing. He is now a man. He's starting to build up some notoriety, notoriety, notoriety. Let's have a little break and let's top up our drinks. My glass is empty. That's not a good sign for nightcap. Let me just top up. Let me come back. Good time for you to top up as well. What are you going to top up with this time? You know, let's wet our whistles. Okay, and I am back. My drink is now topped up. You know, I had half, half a mind to grab myself some mulled wine. I thought, this is, this is nightcap. I'm feeling festive. Grab yourself a mulled wine. But then at the same time, I'm like, well, no. I've still got to put up some Christmas lights after this. Maybe I shouldn't. So, truth be told, I've just re-topped up the coffee. Let's get buzzing off some caffeine. Why the hell not? What have you got? Let me know. You know, did you even get a top up? Are you even still listening to this? Unbelievable. Let me know. And let's move on to part two of the story of George Remus. So Prohibition has kicked off. George has found his loopholes within the system and begins to formulate his plan. All surrounding pharmacies, drug companies and government bonded warehouses. Now it's very difficult for him to kickstart this in Chicago. With Chicago being one of the first places to inflict prohibition it meant the early rise of bootleggers a lot of gangsters moving into the city to start moving products shifting gear aka distributing bourbon so doing it here would mean that he's going to step on a lot of toes empires are already starting to build you know this is chicago this is the land of al capone one of the most violent criminals known to man. You don't want to start a business there. You don't want to start an empire and get involved with all that stuff. So he moves out. He starts figuring, well, where am I going to move instead? Where can I go? And you know where he goes? Cincinnati. I don't know what you're thinking. Cincinnati? Well, where even is that? You know, that doesn't sound like the place to build an empire. Let me explain. What George figured out, smartly of him, very cleverly, is that within a three miles of Cincinnati, was 80% of the country's bonded whisker, which meant basically all of the legally purchased government bourbon, which basically meant that all of the legally purchasable government whiskey in America was at some point going to pass through all surrounding Cincinnati. And there was no gangsters there building an empire, so it was the perfect place. You know, he has this plan in mind, he ends up leaving his wife, Paul Lillian, makes the move over to Cincinnati, starts building his empire, starts small. He's got a plan, he's testing it out. His plan, 
use his pharmaceutical license, buy a pharmacy, buy government bonded whisker, get it delivered to his pharmacy, and then he's going to find a way to kind of illegally distribute that, rig the taxes and find a way through that on his way. Because there's a lot of people hungry for whiskey in America. On the way there, delivering the alcohol to his pharmacy, he ends up getting jumped, ends up getting hijacked. People come in, they rob his whisker. The police can't do anything. They're like, hey, you know, land of the bootleggers. We're trying to stop them, but well, likelihood is you're just going to have to buy some more. Sorry, mate. And he's not, he's not annoyed at this. He's not, he's like, well, actually, this, um, this gives him quite the idea, quite the plan. And then he moves his operation into gear two. Gear two of his operation. Buy the whisker, deliver it to his pharmacy, and on the way, pay people to hijack himself. So now he's being robbed, but he still owns the whisker, and it's now untraceable. It's not on the books no more. It's not on the papers. It's gone. It's been stolen. What well, did the government know it's stolen by himself? And he just starts building up on this. He ends up buying all these drug companies with the idea that they will be using some kind of American whiskey in order to prescribe medicine. And as he starts earning more money, he starts buying up government bonded distilleries and warehouses. So he now owns the warehouses, he owns the bourbon, and he's legally selling it to himself, to his drug companies, and then robbing himself on the way. But with this larger operation, there's larger deliveries, he's got to start outsourcing, he's got to start outsourcing for delivery. He doesn't want to hijack strangers, he doesn't know how that's going to play out. So what does he do? He starts buying the trucking companies. They're the trucks that are going to deliver his whisker from his own bonded government warehouses and deliver it via his own trucks, which he now owns through his own separate trucking company. Deliver that to his own drug companies, which he also owns. It's his drug companies. And along the way, they're going to get unfortunately hijacked by people who he's also paying off. So the whole operation is kind of this well played out theatre. You know, it's like like a play, right? Ooh, I own a government bonded distillery. I'm going to make some whisker and I'm going to sell it to a drug company. Oh, but I also own the drug company. So I know that I've got to buy this whisker. So I'm going to do that. And I need someone to deliver the whisker. Lucky for me, I've got a trucking company. So I'm going to send my trucks to the government bonded warehouses, pick up all the bourbon, and nice, safely and legally deliver them to my own drug companies. But along the way, unfortunately, a couple of people are going to come with guns, stop the truck, rob the truck, steal the whisker. What can you do? It's now off the books. Everyone feels sorry for George. Little does everyone know, he has stole his own whisker. To put this in modern day terms, it's like being in debt, burning down your own house and claiming the insurance. That's what he's doing. Oh, and around this time, he also remarries a woman named Imogen Holmes. Not that important right now in the story, but we'll circle back to that. So remember the name because it will come important later on in the story. So now his operation's grown massively. He needs a place to hide all this whisker. He needs a place to distribute it all. So he buys a farm in Cincinnati called Death Valley Farm. And that is where the not so legal action goes on. Once all the whiskey's been hijacked, they then take the whiskey to Death Valley Farm. This is a farm filled, patrolled by armed guards on the outside. There's whiskey runners on the inside. There's all these people distributing the whiskey. He's got a payroll of like 3,000 members of staff on this farm who are then going to take the whiskey, rebox it, distribute it throughout not just Cincinnati, but throughout Chicago throughout all the kind of surrounding areas and all the states of America and he just keeps growing buying more drug companies buying more government bonded warehouses growing his business growing this empire and it was at this point that he solidifies himself as the king of bootleggers but he's not just the king of bootleggers he solidifies another nickname for himself he's also known as the king of payoffs reason being at this point he is making millions of pounds and now while other gangsters in surrounding areas and other bootleggers would stop any kind of threat from enforcement via the means of violence George is a businessman he's not a criminal well he is a criminal but he's not a criminal so at this point 
instead of using violence to control his operation, he uses large sums of money and large payoffs. So he's paying off all the kind of Cincinnati politicians, the head of law enforcement, all the prohibition agents, all to turn away from Def Fella. Basically saying, here's a hell of a lot of money, don't even look at Def Fella. You don't need to know what's there, look away. Which works. By 1921, George Remus is one of the most wealthy men in America. He is making millions and millions of dollars and he's got nowhere to spend that. He's just throwing these massive, lavish parties. He kind of makes a name for himself just out of his generosity. He goes, he buys a mansion called the Marble Palace. This mansion is like full of these massive marble staircase picture extravagant work of arts and sculptures he has like a big greek indoor swimming pool put in place he starts hosting these massive parties remember george remus does not drink and yet he's throwing these massive parties it's like prohibition does not even exist you go to a george remus party you've got hundreds and hundreds of bottles of champagne and bourbon just flowing through the night you've got jazz bands got orchestras, flapper girls and dancers around, all of kind of high society, politicians, they're all drinking it all, prohibition agents just uh, having a little drink, having a little boulevardier, a little old fashioned, as if prohibition doesn't even exist. It's much like if you're from the United Kingdom, you'll understand the whole world going into lockdown, the government banning Christmas parties and socialising and then secretly throwing their own little wine and cheese get together in 10 Downing Street a day before Boris Johnson is to is to ban that exact thing. That's pretty much what it's like. You know, the government saying, you can't do this, you can't go out, you can't socialise, and then, hey, behind the doors, they're living it up with George Remus, George Remus style. You know, politics aside, he's having a whale of a time all these stories coming out of how lavish these parties are. You know, he's serenading his wife with like mermaids in the pool or women dressed as mermaids, backed by like a 15 piece orchestra. He's just loving life. One of his most infamous parties is his 1921 New Year's Eve party in which any man that attended the party was gifted a diamond pin stick. Now, I don't know what a diamond pin stick is, I'm going to be honest with you, I do not. But what I do know is it's got diamond in the name and it sounds expensive. Not just that, but George Remus wasn't going to forget about ladies. No, he was not. Any woman that attended the party, he gifted a new car. Imagine that. Cars are luxury items today. Never mind the 1920s. You just turn up. Imagine you're a woman turning up at George Remus' party. You're like, hey, what's going on here, Georgia? Why have you got 50 cars? in the parking lot, what's going on there, and he's just like throwing keys out and going, have a car, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car, you a man, look under your seat, what's that, diamond pin stick, he's just giving out millions and millions and millions on just random affairs, right, and his generosity don't just stop at his parties, he also was known for handing out large sums of money to local charities, the stories that if he was riding around town, he would just give children like $100 bills just for, hey, why not? You get some money, you get some money. He was a very generous man, which is why nobody wanted to put an end to his antiques. Even though he's smuggling all this alcohol through Cincinnati, he's also giving off huge payoffs. And you know, this is all happening around 1921. Now in 1924, F. Scott Fitzgerald published the iconic book, The Great Gatsby. That lavish main character, Jay Gatsby, portrayed by Leonardo DiCaprio, was reportedly inspired by George, who by the way, had met Fitzgerald a number of times over at some hotel in Kentucky. So when you see these big parties happening in The Great Gatsby, all that stuff, that is a high chance all that's inspired by none other than George Remus himself. So you may be thinking, right, well, if everyone loves the man, and everyone's happy with the payoffs, where's the fall? Right, it's not all rise, rise, rise. There's got to be some fall. And for that, we get to October 21st, 1921. Chicago prohibition agents move into Cincinnati in order to raid George Remus's Death Valley farm. A lot of the booze from 
Cincinnati and from Jar Dreamers is making its way to other states such as Chicago. The prohibition agents there can't do anything about their own bootleggers like Al Capone. So they decide to move in on George Remus, stop the distribution right at its source. They move in, they raid Death Valley Farm, and they arrest George. Funnily enough, the head of Cincinnati Prohibition Agency Enforcement was highly reluctant on this raid. Reason being, he was on George's payroll, he was being paid off as well. But, alas, it's come to an end. George is now in prison, he gets a quite a light sentence of just two years behind bars and that is when everything starts to crumble. Whilst in prison, he befriends another inmate. They become like best buds, right? Prison friends. Yay! They're best mates. He starts telling him all about kind of how his operation is ready to kickstart again. Doesn't matter that they have control over Death Valley because all of his legal assets, the government bonded warehouses which are legal, the drug companies, the trucking company, they're all legal, he can re-kickstart his operation once he gets out and he still has a lot of money to do that hidden around which is all in control of his wife, remember Imogen? She now controls all of his assets and all of his money until he gets out of prison. Now as it turns out, that best friend of him was none other than a man called Franklin Dodge. Now Franklin was an undercover prohibition agent who was sent to prison undercover in order to get this kind of information out of George. Instead of going to his superiors and saying, hey, look what I found out, he decides to resign from his job, quit the force, move in on Imogen and start to seduce her, start to, you know, hey, we should get together. And then comes the affair of Imogen and Franklin Dodge. George's former undercover best pal. So whilst George is spending time behind bars, Franklin's out fucking his wife, spending up all his money, they start selling off all of his assets. He's built this multi-million dollar empire and they're just selling it off, they're getting rid of it. That is, oof, let me tell you, they are putting in the work. Now remember, George only has a two year prison sentence, so they know he's getting out. And once he's getting out, they try to get him deported back to Germany. That doesn't pan out too well, so then they go plan B. They hire a hitman for $15,000 to go and assassinate George Remus. The hitman takes the money, runs off to George Remus and tells him the story. He's fearful of being double crossed by Franklin, doesn't want to go through with the assassination, tells George everything. This highly pisses off George as it would now. In late 1927, Imogen is on her way to divorce George. She's on her way to the courts to file the final divorce papers, which will solidify her access to the rest of what little money George has left. He finds out where she's staying, and on her way to court, he has his man drive him, chase Imogen's car, book it off the road, they go on this long car chase throughout Cincinnati. He chases her off the road, jumps out the car, shoots her cold blood in front of a lot of onlookers, loads of people there. He has no mindset of who's here, who's watching, maybe I should pay someone else to do this. He gets out personally himself, shoots her dead, cold blood in front of everyone. Obviously, he's an educated man. He knows the law and he knows, well, there's absolutely no way of getting out of this. I am completely and utterly fucked. So instead, he turns himself in. He goes to, he goes to the police station. He says, hey, I'm George Remus. I've just killed my wife. You should probably arrest me. They arrest him. He ends up going to court. Whilst in court, he decides that he's going to defend himself. Why? Because it's what he does. No one can defend a murder trial quite like George Remus. So he defends himself. And what does he do? What defense technique does he use to help get himself off? None other than his own pioneered technique, which is the transitory defense, temporary insanity. He claims the exact same thing that he claimed for William way back before he ever built an empire. And he starts saying, well, I was insane, you know? Why else? 
would I kill my wife in cold blood in front of a bunch of people when I've never killed anyone before, when I'm not a violent man, why would I do that unless I was temporarily lost my mind? He tells the court a story, oh she's been cheating on me, she stole all my money, that forced me to lose my mind, so I killed her. I don't remember it, I was insane. And it's quite easy to believe this, because not only is he really great at manipulating people, not only is he great at formulating a plan, but he's the kind of guy that talks to himself in third person, so he's, all, he's already got this kind of insane character to him. So it's very easy for the jury to believe him. In fact, it takes them just 18 minutes of deliberating before he gets sentenced to just seven months, and not even in prison, seven months in a mental institute. He goes there and that is basically, that's basically the end of George's story. You might be wondering, okay, so what did he do after that? Did he come out? Did he restart? Did he restart his bootlegging empire? Not really. By the time he's out, this is 1928. It's only five years before Prohibition ends anyway, so all these bootlegging empires are going to fall. He decides, you know what, I'm done with that now. I've still got a bit of money stashed about. I'm going to just go spend that. He ends up remarrying a third time. He moves down the river to Kentucky. He starts tutoring people in law. He starts a property development company. You know, he lives quite a, quite a happy life, way up until like 1950. When he suffered a stroke, after which he spent the next two years living in boarding houses in the care of a nurse, and then he died January 20th, 1952, at the ripe old age of 73. He had good innings, that man. And with that, we conclude our story of today. I hope you liked it, I hope you enjoyed it, and if you've made it this far throughout this podcast, please consider hitting the subscribe button or follow button or whatever you do, wherever you're listening to this. Maybe you're on Spotify. Give it a little follow. Maybe you're on Google Play. I don't think you can do anything on there. Maybe you're listening to it on the SmartBlend website. You know, check out some of the other podcasts I do. Really appreciate the support in order to grow this podcast, in order to keep doing it. You know, these little things, they really help do that. Cheeky follow, cheeky like, maybe even a share. You know, even reach out to me. You can find me on my website, smartblend.co.uk. Send me a little message. Jump on my Instagram. I've got two Instagrams the underscore cocktail coach and the mindful underscore mixologist jump out on there shoot me a little message and just say hey i enjoyed the story or i didn't any feedback you've got i'd love to hear it and look forward to seeing you on the next story bye for now